Good morning and welcome to Tronconi Segura and Associates 2020 Accounting Year End Update. I'm Dan Spada and we thank you for joining us on what is suddenly a snowy day outside of our flagship office here in Williamsville. 2020 has been a challenging year in many ways and it's hard to believe we are now in the middle of December. With everything that occurred this year, it's understandable that accounting changes may not have received the usual attention. But the FASB did make some changes this year, including delaying certain standards to help ease the burden on business during what has been a most unusual year, all of which we will discuss today along with some other topics. At this point, I'll direct your attention to the top right-hand part of your screen. You should have a bar in this area. That area is gonna have handouts, uh, which will be today's slide deck, as well as provide you the ability to ask any questions that you might have. During this webinar, for those that complete the full hour, we'll also be offering CPE for New York State Certified Public Accountants. In order to obtain 1.0 CPE credit, you need to view at least 50 minutes, complete three of the four poll questions, and then fill out a survey after the webinar. A few topics today. We'll be discussing the deferral of the revenue recognition and lease standards, more changes to revenue recognition in the post-implementation phase of ASC 606, a change for, on the reference rate regarding LIBOR on many people's loans, COVID-19 accounting considerations, accounting for your PPP loan, and then preparing for your auditors at year end and what will be likely a different year end than we've experienced in the past. Our presenters today are two partners from our ANA practice, Mark Firm, who is our practice leader for the ANA group here at Tronconi Segur and Associates, and Chuck Pizzino, who's a partner in our ANA group. At this time, I will pass it on to Chuck, who can start in with our presentation. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Dan. Um, I'm gonna start the discussion with the deferral of the revenue recognition and lease standards. Uh, for many on the phone who are um, calendar year companies, it's likely that uh, you've already implemented revenue recognition topic 606, or referred to as simply as ASU 606. Um, to the extent that you've already implemented it, the revenue recognition portion of this won't be applicable to you. But there still is good news, uh, depending on your perspective, with respect to the lease standards. So essentially, the FASB is acknowledging that both of these standards can be extremely challenging to implement, and even more challenging to implement uh, when everyone is uh, working from home or addressing dealing with the pandemic. And so, for those that have not yet implemented as of June 2020, um, there's going to be a deferral. So. Basically, let's uh, flip to the next slide and just quickly talk about the deferrals for, with respect to the revenue standards. So again, most calendar year companies, public, non-public, have already adopted 606. Um, hopefully, you know if you have. I know this is something that we were helping our clients with, but um, you know, for some clients, like the cash and carry type business models or ship and bill, however you want to describe it, the impact could have been um, fairly mundane and, and not too challenging other than disclosures. For many others, this was quite a process um, that could have taken uh, a significant amount of effort to get through. Regardless, um, if you haven't done it yet, you're gonna have uh, a little bit more time. So I can think of you know common year ends as 6.30 or 9.30 year ends. For uh, non-public companies in those, in those buckets, they're likely gonna not adopt until the fiscal year beginning, 6-30-2020 or 9-30-2020, or and then you won't have to worry about reporting this until your end of, end of the year, uh, end of fiscal year, 6-30-21 or 9-30-21. Um, so, you know, again, uh, just a nice thing that the FASB did here just to kind of help those companies uh, work through the pandemic. Leases, you know, it seems like a, kind of a broken record with yet another deferral here, but, um, for all non-public companies who likely have not adopted the lease standard yet, the deferral now takes you to your first fiscal year beginning after December 15th, 2021. 
So this won't really be until 2022 for most calendar year companies and maybe even a little later um, for those that are off calendar years. So nice, uh, nice deferral here, but um, you know, just uh, have to be an accountant and tell you don't wait um, to begin thinking about the implementation, even though you have more time. This particular topic can really be challenging to implement. We've done it for several public companies so far that we've helped with and, and even a few that um, aren't yet public or are considering becoming public. Um, and it, it can be time consuming, especially if you have quite a few leases. Um, and even in, in situations where it's not actually a lease, but it's a service contract where there's an embedded lease for, let's say, a computer server, um, this can take quite a bit of time. So the sooner you can think about start implementing this and categorizing your leases and inventorying them, the, the better. But you do have some, some additional time thanks to the FASB. Yeah, Chuck, if I could just uh, kind of add, add some commentary there to you. You know, I think we, we've had a lot of conversations with clients about this, and I think there was a, a big sigh of relief when the lease standard was, was uh, deferred. Uh, but at that time, you know, there was many companies that, uh, other than public companies, that had done a lot of work uh, in implementing this new standard. And I think when the pandemic hit, certainly companies had other challenges and things that needed to tend to. And we kind of see that, you know, those challenges continue on to the first and maybe even second quarter. And as people, hopefully, as we emerge out of the pandemic, you know, people are going to, you know, hopefully be attending to, you know, real business needs. And so before you know it, 2021 will be over and uh, the implementation will be upon us. So it's something to kind of talk to. Okay, thanks guys. Let's uh, take time for our first poll here. And our first poll is basically asking, where are you in the least standard adoption process? And a reminder that to get CPE credit, you will have to respond to three polls out of the four we're going to do during this hour. And a minimum of 50 minutes, so don't leave after the third poll. Great <laughs> point, Chuck. Leave it open for about 20 more seconds. Look at like about 80% have, have voted thus far. As we close the poll, um, somewhat interesting, somewhat interesting results. Uh, almost 40% haven't started yet. Is that a surprise at all, Chuck? Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit surprising, Dan, but uh, you know, there's, there's still time. So uh, how about on the other side? 20% is already done. That's surprising. Yeah, I think that is surprising, actually. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's dive into uh, an, another facet of revenue recognition. This is for the, the companies that have already implemented ASC 606. Um, and really just thinking about the year two or beyond of implementation. Um, this is one of those standards that, uh, you know, isn't really one and done. You know, that you'll go through the initial implementation to get all your customer contracts um, in compliance with AOC, ASC 606. But beyond that, um, we all know that customer relationships are ever evolving. Um, you know, there are uh, um, new customer relationships, which will have to be evaluated. Uh, new, potentially new products and services, which will have to be evaluated. Um, potentially new policies or offerings with respect, re with respect to rebates, allowances, warranties, you know, any of those types of changes could have an impact under ASC 606. Um, there also could be uh, changes with your existing customers with the, with respect to agreements or, um, you know, products and services, which could simply just result in additional disclosure requirements. So you really need to be considering, you know, all the changes um, in a given year, assuming you're only reporting on an annual basis. 
and determining, you know, what the impact might be under 606. You know, for the most part, um, if you have a new customer relationship that is consistent with other customer relationships, let's say, for instance, you have homogenous customer contracts, you know, they're all sort of cash and carry, ship and bill type, type models, that likely is not going to have an impact. However, if you enter into a customer relationship that has some nuances, for instance, um, a, it's a long duration contract with a delivery uh, period over, you know, over months or maybe a year, or perhaps um, you're bundling something in the customer contract like a product with a service, or perhaps you're promising something in the future that hasn't yet, is not yet available. Or perhaps you're offering them some type of volume rebate that says if they buy a certain amount of product, um, they'll get an X discount uh, applied retroactively. You know, all those types of things could result in challenges from a 606 perspective that you should be discussing internally and then ultimately with your, with your auditors to make sure that they're addressed correctly. Okay, I'm going to change topics and move into uh, a discussion around LIBOR reference rate. So, Dan, thank you. Um, you know, advance us to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, and just a reminder, you know, I, I, um, I should have mentioned up, 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 up at the forefront that these slides are a little bit detailed and that's intentional. Um, you know, we wanted to give you as much information in the slide deck as possible. But, you know, my comments will, will be relatively brief on each topic since we have a lot to get through. Please ask any questions that you might have. And then, of course, uh, either Mark or I um, are going to be available anytime after the webinar to address uh, questions. You can email us or, or call us, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Um, LIBOR is, you know, most people will recognize it. As a, as a reference rate that's often found in debt agreements. Um, it can also be used in hedging relationships. Um, that's probably the two most common places you're going you're gonna to see it. Um, LIBOR is a, what's referred to as a reference rate. It's a rate that's published um, on a daily basis, and it has a couple different durations. I think it starts with three months, and it goes in three months and increments all the way to 12 months. So, Oftentimes, uh, a debt arrangement will say the interest rate is going to be LIBOR plus, and usually that plus is going to be one, two, three percent. And they'll, they'll oftentimes then define LIBOR as the three month rate or the six month rate, whatever it may be. Um, and that's, that's very common. It's been used since the 1980s. So it's, it's definitely present in quite a few um, debt agreements. The problem with LIBOR is that it's a hypothetical rate. It's although it's published daily, it's calculated based on hypothetical borrowing transactions submitted by only a few banks. So these are going to be your Bank of America and your JP Morgan and you know the larger banks are submitting these types of rates. Um, they are hypothetical and therefore they are definitely subject to potential manipulation. Um, not going to get into it in this particular webinar, but there have been instances where LIBOR was specifically um, manipulated, and you know the perpetrators were uh, were charged with the, with the crime in that case. But um, you know, since it's hypothetical, it's subject to manipulation, and therefore the the financial community is going to be moving away from using LIBOR as a reference rate. What's what's going to replace LIBOR? Likely, it's going to be something called the SOFR or the Secured Overnight Financing Rate. This rate is not hypothetical. Instead, this rate is overseen by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and it's a borrowing rate based on the overnight U.S. Uh, UST or U.S. Treasury Repurchase Agreement or repos. So, so basically, if we move the SOFR, and I say if, you know, JP Morgan has begun issuing new debt linked to SOFR. Other banks have yet to decide which, which reference rate they're going to use. It's likely to be SOFR, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, but the nice thing about this rate is it's not, not hypothetical at all. It is based on, on actual borrowing rates. The, the, the flip side challenge, I guess, of, of this particular rate is that it could be subject to volatility depending on what happens in the overnight market. 
And there have been instances where the overnight market has done some crazy things. Um, and so therefore, you could experience more volatility in your borrowing rate or your interest rate if they have the SOFR base plus, you know, some percentage point. It's uncommon for extreme volatility, so I wouldn't be too worried about it. But it's just something to consider. You end up being in a, a uh, you end up having a reference rate that's SOFR based. Um, you know, with respect to, so on the next slide, uh, with respect to, um, you know, who this is going to impact, you know, again, anybody who currently has a LIBOR reference rate in a debt agreement, hedging relationship, um, asset backed securities, you know, potentially, you're likely going to be impacted. Um, you're probably going to have until 2021 until LIBOR is phased out. So it's likely you're going to hear from your, your lenders or your counterparties relatively soon with respect to their plans to move away from LIBOR. You could uh, certainly do an inventory of all your contracts now just to make sure that you're contacting, if you want to be proactive, contacting all those lenders or counterparties just to see when you can expect um, to hear from them with respect to which reference rate they're going to move to. What you should not be um, experiencing is a significant change in, the, in your borrowing um, in, in the cost of borrowing. So hopefully moving from LIBOR to SOFR or wherever it's, whichever reference rate your lender or counterparty will choose, the, the actual interest rate that you're experiencing should be relatively flat. So, you know, likely they're going to be doing a historical look back on SOFR and then they'll decide, okay, in order to be commensurate with LIBOR, it needs to be SOFR plus 3.5% rather than LIBOR plus three, for instance. So this shouldn't end up costing you more. It's just really a, um, this really all comes down to, you know, documentation matter, uh, reference rate change, and then ultimately um, just making sure all the places this is impacting your business are, are addressed appropriately. Internally, you might be using the LIBOR rate, like for instance, if you have, um, you know, a stock uh, acquisition right or, um, you know, something else you may be using LIBOR for internally. So, you, you know, again, you should be considering this for internal purposes as well. Hey, Chuck, yeah, if I could just uh, jump in and make a couple comments on some uh, the feedback we're getting from our clients. Because I think this particular, uh, uh, you know, LIBOR reform in terms of the accounting and disclosure impact, I think was taking a lot of, uh, um, a lot of our clients uh, by surprise uh, to a certain degree. I think that when people sort of reading the headlines, they were considering more, oh, this, this is related to the banks. I really don't have to worry about this too much. But I think what, what some of the changes uh, that might impact, um, you know, private companies in particular are the, the, the time it takes to amend debt and lease agreements. And to the extent you have a lot of lease agreements that can be quite time consuming. The other thing that comes up uh, from time to time too is accounting for interest rate swaps. This is a common derivative that's used uh, even by private companies. And, you know, when you have a modification to an agreement for an interest rate swap, so if you have to change the, the reference rate in a swap agreement, that could be considered a new agreement or a modification, and therefore you might lose uh, the ineffective or the effectiveness criteria that would cause the lead to, uh, to lose the, um, you know, the, the favorable accounting under hedge accounting. And so what the FASB did is they issued actually a standard in the summertime to uh, give some, some uh, a little bit of alleviation towards those requirements and allow companies if it meets certain criteria that you won't lose that hedge effectiveness just because of the uh, change from LIBOR. So thanks, John. Good point, Mark. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. At this time, we're going to launch our second poll of the webinar. So this is actually about LIBOR and asking, are you affected by the LIBOR reference rate standard? And again, to get CPE credit, you will need to have three questions answered. Um, so you know, hopefully you are taking advantage of that opportunity. And 
while we're waiting on these answers, uh, you know, we've had some, some questions come through, and again, please feel free to submit them using that uh, toolbar in the upper right-hand corner. We've had some questions kind of come in about leases and revenue rec, and I guess, you know, perhaps a few different questions. One is, for revenue rec, what are we doing to kind of help clients that maybe have already <clears throat> implemented, but kind of need to do that continuing evaluation? <clears throat> Yeah, you know, if you if you happen to be our client and we're the one performing the audit, we'll have a great basis for um, the the original impact of ASC 606, and really our focus can be on what's changed and how it potentially will result in, in new accounting. Um, if you if if we happen to be providing a service to you, you're not necessarily our client, but we're assisting you with your implementation. Um, you know, again, it it really will be forming a basis for which contracts are, are mundane, easy to account for, let's get those out of the population. And let's just look at the ones that are outliers or a little bit unusual and specifically address those. But ultimately, um, either way, we can help the company prepare a memorandum describing uh, what was considered, what the impact was, how the literature applies, and ultimately the conclusion for the accounting, and then help you to continue to, to monitor that on a go-forward basis just to make sure there's no surprises at your end. Okay, some poll results for you. Uh, perhaps not surprising to see 16%. This is the first they're hearing of it, uh, especially when you consider that about 51% are saying that they don't have LIBOR loans. Does that sound about right to you guys? So 50% of the population have LIBOR loans and no, they, don't. they don't have it. Does that mean 50% do? <laughs> and, uh, and, and out of that population, many haven't, haven't hadn't heard about this yet. Yeah, it's totally not surprising. I mean, I don't think a lot of, a lot of the lenders, especially um, maybe some of the mid-sized ones, have really started to address this yet. They're probably waiting on, on the larger banks to, to uh, basically to select a, a reference rate and they'll probably follow suit. So I think you know, should be hearing from people soon, especially if LIBOR really does get phased out by the end of 2021 which may be delayed a bit just given the circumstances. Yeah, I think the other dynamic that occurred too is the pandemic. And so a lot of the banks have been uh, spending their time with uh, the PPP loans and forgiveness and, and those uh, types of issues. So that's kind of put this a little bit more on the, on the back burner to a certain degree. Okay, um, thank you for that, Dan. So now I'm gonna move into COVID-19 accounting considerations. Um, we're just gonna take you through a few various topics, things to start considering um, as you're looking forward for accounting your companies to your to your year end audit or or review or just your year end reporting. Um, you know the first the first topic that I'd like to cover is forward looking information. So the use of forward looking information um, is is primarily in the areas of cash flow forecasting with respect to determining the realizability of deferred tax assets. Um, it's used in, with respect to the impairment of non-financial assets like goodwill or non-advertising intangibles. It's also used to determine the entity's ability to continue as a going concern for at least the next 12 months. And you know, it, this can be an extremely challenging environment to prepare a cash flow forecast you know, typical typical way to prepare a, a cash flow forecast to take historical and then to add uh, some type of um, growth rate. So, you know, historical sales plus three uh, percent, historical expenditures plus three percent. You know, that's that's a typical way to do a forecast, and then plus any you know unusual items that uh, the company's aware of, in, you know, the next twelve months or beyond. But given the COVID-19 situation, you really are gonna to have to look at the specific impact on your business and your industry, to your customer base, and try to look at those macro conditions and determine how they may impact your, your cash flow forecasting. This obviously is not easy, but I think the, the number one takeaway here is that, you know, sort of using the historical modeling of, of, of historical results, plus or minus, you know, a certain percentage point is really not going to be applicable for, or appropriate for most businesses. A much more thoughtful approach is going to have to be taken 
as to how COVID-19 is really going to be impacting your business um, in 2021 and, and beyond. Um, and so really, really encouraging people or companies to take a much more thoughtful approach to this and get started early because this, this could be probably one of the more challenging aspects of your year-end reporting. On the next slide, this is sort of goes hand in hand with forward-looking information. You know, again, um, impairment tests for long-lived assets like non-advertising intangibles and goodwill. Um, these don't necessarily require you to do a discounted cash flow analysis every year. In many cases, um, under the, the more recent guidance from the FASB, you're allowed to do a qualitative assessment. And that qualitative assessment is simply to look at, uh, you know, this, this past year and, and going forward qualitatively and to determine that, you know, you really don't think there's any signs uh, with respect to potential impairment of your non-advertising intangibles and goodwill. But it's very likely that that qualitative assessment is not going to be appropriate under the circumstances, especially if COVID-19 has had a significant impact on your business, your client base, your vendors, um, your supply chain. You know, all those things can have an impact. And so it's possible that you're going to conclude that a qualitative assessment is not sufficient. You're going to have to move into a quantitative assessment for at least for 12-31-2020. And then all of a sudden you're going to have to deal with, uh, you know, discounting, uh, discounting cash flow analysis and the challenge of forecasting. So just something to be thinking about. Um, this won't impact all businesses. You know, restaurants uh, are clearly impacted, for instance, whereas, um, you know, some uh, manufacturers really can't keep enough, uh, can't produce enough product to keep their, keep on top of their customer demand. So, you know, every business is unique and different. And you're just going to have to consider, um, you know, how it impacts you. I would also say the the last uh, bullet on this particular slide is that, um, you know, many companies are are considering disposing a business um, or some, you know, some some facet of your business, and you're going to have to consider as uh, with regard to whether this kind of uh, um, this. I really should say, sorry, this shouldn't say discounted operation accounting. This should say discontinued operations accounting um, applies. And also, you know, you may be considering closing a location or um, no, maybe you're thinking about subleasing a portion of your lease space. You know, maybe you don't need all the lease space you currently have, but you're locked into a long-term lease agreement. All these things can have accounting implications. So, you know, this, this gap accounting um, is definitely challenging. Um, if you have assets that you're no longer utilizing, you're going to have to look to um, potentially impairing those assets or accelerating the depreciation if, you haven't, if you're still using them, but they have a shorter duration. Um, if there's a portion of your lease space that you're no longer utilizing, you may have to record a liability for all the remaining rent today, um, unless you think that it's likely you're going to be able to sublease that in which you can reduce that liability. So a lot of accounting implications, these are just things that are reminders and that you should be talking to your uh, your accounting advisor, your auditor about these types of situations early on so there's no surprises during the audit or the review. Next topic is, um, is not a fun one, but it's, it's going concern. Um, you know, you'll recall that the burden is on management to demonstrate that the company has the ability to continue as a going concern for at least one year after the date that the financial statements are issued. Um, to the extent that there are any um, doubts with respect to the ability to continue as a going concern, management has the burden to document the um, plans that will be implemented to address those doubts such that, the, such that there's no substantial uh, unremediated un, um, doubt with respect to the company's ability to continue to go into concern. If the auditors agree with management's plans, we don't have to modify our opinion necessarily, although we may put an emphasis on matter paragraph in there just to point to management's dis disclosures about their ability to continue to go into concern. However, if we disagree with um, management uh, remediation plan or plan to address their ability to continue going concern and may result in a in an adverse opinion. Um, 
But, you know, the most challenging aspect of this, uh, which is obvious, is the impact of COVID-19 on not only the, the business in this past year and cash flows, but also as management's plan to address, to address those going forward. Um, you know, there's obviously been operational disruption. You know, we talked about uh, this diminished the demand from customers um, for respective products or services. And we can talk about supply chain disruption. Um, you know, all those things are, are definitely important to consider when we're making this assessment. On the, uh, on the next slide, definitely something that I want to, to point out um, is that uh, many, well, not many, but some debt agreements have something called the material adverse effect clause. And this can be very important to discuss with your lender um, just to make sure that they are they agree that that hasn't happened with respect to your business. In some cases, um, you know, if your if your business has been significantly impacted by COVID-19, it's possible that they would conclude a material adverse effect has indeed happened. And if it has happened, the clause is likely going to allow was going to allow the bank or the lender to call your debt. So even if you have a five-year term or something longer. If a material adverse effect is deemed to have happened, the debt potentially could be callable under the terms of your existing debt agreement. So obviously that is not a surprise that you want. You want to make sure that you're having this discussion with your lender to, to definitely um, solidify their position on whether or not this has happened. Hopefully in most situations, the conclusion will, will be that it has not happened. Anything that has happened to your business is temporary and that you're expecting to make full recovery and material adverse effect has not uh, transpired. Okay. I'm going to move into subsequent events briefly. Uh, with respect to subsequent events, um, you know, many companies actually had to deal with this last year when their financials were being issued. You know, let's just say that uh, those financials were being issued in March or April. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic had already hit, and so many companies had to decide what they had to disclose in their financial statements. You know, oftentimes, um, you know, that disclosure would, would refer to investments, you know, where the investments that the company has made had taken a substantial, uh, um, you know, decline, and so therefore that was being discussed. Sometimes there was uh, supply chain disruption or customer demand. You know, whatever it was that, that likely was disclosed last year. And we're all going to have to kind of consider that again for this year and the impact of the ongoing pandemic and, and what may transpire subsequent to year end and what, what needs to be disclosed or conversely, what is having an impact uh, or what, what would have been um, information that has an impact on the balance sheet as of 1231 and potentially would have to be accounted for. So, you know, you'll recall these two types of subsequent events. So again, just a reminder here that, um, you know, just to keep your eye on this and, you know, this, this either will likely result in additional disclosure to your business or in some cases will have to be accounted for as of 1231. All right, last thing under COVID-19 accounting considerations are contract modifications. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about contract modifications from a customer standpoint. Those could have an impact under ASC 606, or even the old accounting rec uh, revenue recognition if you have not adopted 606 yet. But the most common type of contract modification I want to make some comments about are leases. So whether or not you've adopted the new lease standard, in most cases you haven't, um, if there has been a modification to your lease agreement, um, and the most common being that your landlord has um, allowed you to defer certain rent payments, that is going to have accounting implica uh, implications that need to be considered. So on the next slide, um, you know, again, the most common uh, modification is going to be the deferral of lease payments. You know, to the extent that you were given a deferral, um, and that's the only thing that changed, the FASB has created um, or has a Q&A, which basically says that you don't have to treat that as a as a, um, as a new lease contract, so you can say that's just a continuation of your existing contract. And basically, with respect to the deferral, you're going to have two options. Um, neither is better than the other, so you can choose whichever is more um, preferable to you. 
But option one is that you just continue accounting for your lease um, the way you always have. And so let's say they gave you a concession for April and May lease, uh, lease payments. You don't have to make those until a later date. You still would, would charge those to rent expense and you still would book a payable with respect to those payments. It's just that the payable might be long term if you don't have to make those for longer than 12 months. So in a sense, in essence, the only thing that's changed here is you didn't actually make the cash payment. Everything else is the same. The second option is you can treat those as variable lease payments and basically only account for those, those deferred payments when you actually make them. So to the extent you got a two month deferral for 2020, um, with whatever month those might be, you're only gonna have 10 months of rent expense in your P&L. And those extra two months of rent expense will likely come at the tail end of the lease agreement or however the deferral works in your situation. You'd recognize those expense when you actually make the payment. Okay, um, before I move into PPP, I think there's one more poll question. That's right, Chuck. We're going to launch our third poll question right now. We're discussing the topics that you recently just touched on. Um, what COVID related accounting issues are you most concerned about? Going concern, impairment, contract modifications, or all of the above? Uh, I will say, you know, we've gotten a few questions about tax issues. Makes sense. Uh, we obviously have not covered those today. Why is that? It's because we're actually having a tax webinar this Thursday at 10 a.m. You can register on our website, tsacpa.com. Go to the blog section, um, or you likely register for this webinar based off of an email. Uh, right below the registration for this one was a registration for the tax webinar. And so we will go more in depth on COVID related tax issues, as well as other updates that occurred during the year on Thursday. So that's why we, we haven't forgotten about it certainly, but that's uh, been a, a reason we have not discussed it today. And just as a reminder, uh, answering three out of four polling questions to get CPE credit, uh, but you also have to be uh, present for uh, 50 minutes. So that's right, and we got a good response Let's kind of see what the, that looks like now. And it's, it, it's pretty mixed. Contract modifications kind of leading the way, but all of the above, um, you know, certainly is cer certainly a factor there. Um, are, are we maybe not taking impairment or going concern as a, a serious of consideration at this point, Chuck? Well, I'd say that, um, you know, I think that uh, with respect to going concern and impairment, I think we're all, um, well, many of us are uh, eternal optimists, and I think we're all expecting the situation to kind of um, be overcome in the short order and, and get back to, to normal circumstances. And I, you know, I think that, um, you know, and, and it's to the extent that that plays out, and, then, and I hope it does, um, impairment and going concern are much less of, a, of, a, of an issue. Keep in mind though that, um, you know, with respect to going concern, we, there's really only a 12 month outlook from the date the financials are issued. So it, it is somewhat short term. So if, if you think that in the short term, you're gonna have, have an issue with respect to your ability to um, pay your cash, your, your, your debt obligations, for instance, or other things that could, derail your business, it's really the next 12 months that matter the most with respect to that conclusion. And impairment, you know, again, um, you have to take the facts and circumstances as they currently are. You, you can, you know, you can make some, some forecast decisions, you know, that, um, you know, beyond one year in that circumstance, they, they do consider coming out of the situation and, and how that's going to look. But, you know, if you do have impairment now, um, you know, it, it is, it's important to, to recognize that impairment charge, and then that's not reversible if, if things uh, don't play out as, as poorly as we thought that they may be. So anyway, not, not really surprising, but I think many, many people have renegotiated their lease agreements, especially during the shutdown when they weren't utilizing the lease space. It was just, you know, really, really penalizing to have to make those payments if they weren't using the space. So 
I think deferrals are pretty common. Yeah, and, and I know Chuck, you were very involved in a lot of the COVID stuff that we've done at the firm, but Mark, uh, is it potentially a case that with everything going on, our clients just haven't gotten to some of these considerations yet? Yeah, I think that's right. They're just trying to you know, kind of come up with a business plan. It's a great point. Um, and you know, I think the other thing that we could potentially see is if there if there are uncertainties as we get into the audits for this year, you know, companies may uh, start to think about delaying the release of their final audit financial statements to give them better information as to what the impact of the pandemic is going to be. You know, certainly that would carry with it. You know, you, you want to contact your bank to the extent there's a deadline, but I could see you know companies. Uh, you know, kind of delaying that issuance. But yeah, certainly the, the focus now is running the business, and I think some of these are going to probably come up in the January, February timeframe. Okay, um, I, I'm, I'm going to run through PPP a little bit uh, more quickly. Um, I just want to make sure I leave plenty of time for Mark's important topics. So, you know, I'll, I'll simply say that there's really two options for accounting for your PPP loan. You know, to the extent that at year end you haven't yet been forgiven, you're either going to have to report it as debt on your on your balance sheet, um, or you can choose government grant accounting. And under that scenario, which is the next slide, um, you can basically amortize your PPP loan to other income um, over the the covered period. And so, most likely, your covered period is expired. Therefore. Using this government grant accounting analogy, as long as you think forgiveness is a foregone conclusion, it's really just perfunctory for you to file your application and, and get the forgiveness letter, you could have amortized your, your loan into income during 2020. So two options. Um, my preference is debt accounting. I think it makes more sense, but a lot of businesses don't want that debt on their books as of um, the end of the year for, for whatever reason, um, and we can talk briefly about that company. But so if, for, if, if that's the situation, then government grant accounting is available to you. Even if you're a non-governmental agency or a business, you can, you can apply that. The ACICPA has definitely um, supported that type of accounting. But I think the preference is debt accounting. Leave the debt on your books until you get forgiveness. Recognize the gain in the year that you get the forgiveness, which is likely 2021. I will, I'll simply say that uh, on this next slide that, um, you know, I've had a lot of questions about this, but account for your expenditures that are used for forgiveness like you normally would. Um, do not net those down. So when you do get forgiveness, um, you know, they're probably going to be in two different years, but if they're spent there in the same year, your expenditures um, get recorded growth and your, and your gain from the forgiveness is recorded growth and other income outside of operating income. Don't have the expenditures down, that's not the appropriate accounting. Um, and on the next slide, I'll simply say that, uh, you know, it's, it's a good idea for you to take a look at your debt covenants, and if you think that having the PPP loan on your books is gonna cause issues, you may wanna consider the government grant accounting. Although it's very, very likely that any lender is gonna give you a waiver with respect to any debt covenants that are that are failed as a result of having the PPP load on your books. Every lender is going to realize that that's a short-term thing. As long as you follow the rules, you're going to get forgiveness. So it really is not a, it has no impact on your ability to pay your other debt obligations. Therefore, a waiver would definitely be in order, in my opinion. Um, and then keep in mind that any, any unforgiven portion of your PPP will become debt and will be accounted for as debt, just like any other debt. And this will include any up, any $10,000 emergency relief grant you got under the EIDL program. Um, some people got less than 10, max usually was 10. Um, if you got that, that's not going to be the forgiven portion of your PPP. And you're going to have to treat that as debt and pay it off over um, the next, likely the next two years. Chuck, quick question. Uh, people are asking about PPP and taxes. So what you were just discussing as far as recognizing the gain, that differs from how it will be treated for tax purposes. And again, this will be covered on Thursday for the tax webinar. Yeah, and that's the me thunder. Definitely encourage you to uh, sign up for the tax webinar um, and hear from our experts. I will tell you very, very simplistically, my comments were all about books. For tax purposes, the gain is not a taxable gain, so that's good news. 
bad news is until uh, um, Congress can get their act in order, um, currently the current rule is that the expenditures you use for PPP forgiveness are not deductible, which is a roundabout way of saying that you're going to have to pay tax on the forgiveness portion, essentially. Um, so expenditures are currently not forgivable. However, there's quite a bit of bipartisan support to get that particular um, decision by the IRS overruled. So let's all keep our fingers crossed that it doesn't come to fruition. But at the moment, for tax planning purposes, you should be anticipating that expenditures used for forgiveness are not going to be tax deductible. And therefore, it's going to have an impact on your tax return come, uh, come March or April. So keep that in mind. But let's all keep our fingers crossed that the uh, government can get their um, can get through this and, and come out with the right decision for, for struggling borrowers. Yeah, just the difference between book and tax there. All right, at this time, let's shift it over to Mark a little bit to talk about kind of preparing for your auditors and for year end. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Dan and Chuck. And one of the things I wanted to mention before we uh, move on in regards to uh, the book accounting for PPP, one of the common questions that we get also is, should that be included in EBITDA or not? Uh, EBITDA is a, is a really key measure for a lot of private companies when they calculate debt covenants and when there's, you know, when they're valuing the business. And we obviously, from the bank's perspective, you know, each bank you may look at it differently, but you know, we're surmising that many banks are going to look at that as non-recurring income that would be excluded from EBITDA. So just as a, you know, it's, again, an important measure that a lot of people on this uh, call will probably be faced with in the, in the coming year. So moving on to preparing for auditors. Um, it's been certainly a unique year. We have faced uh, some of these topics already. Uh, as, as we all know, the pandemic started, you know, late February, early March. And we were, for a lot of our clients, uh, uh, either in the, in the process of concluding audits or in some cases uh, just starting them. So we've had to go through a lot of these considerations. And I think this year it's going to be even more uh, sort of sort of more enhanced in terms of the considerations as you get ready for your auditors to come out. So some of the unique risks that auditors are likely going to spend a lot of time on, and this is kind of uh, goes back to some of the commentary that uh, that's really Chuck had earlier, you know, accounting estimates. So estimates to come up with potential impairment charges or not, uh, reserves for uh, bad debt and inventory. Uh, certainly, those are going to be areas that, as we've experienced uh, downward trends in the economy, could be considerations there uh, regarding that, as well as a going concern, as Chuck had mentioned. Other unique risks we'll talk about is fraud. As many of our clients are working from home, how do the internal controls and fraud controls operate at our clients? And with people you know, working from home, uh, are those controls still effective? When, when people aren't on, on site working together, what changes were made to, you know, hopefully uh, continue uh, for those controls to continue to be effective. So obtaining audit, uh, audit evidence, uh, we've, we've done a lot of this. Uh, actually, most of this year, we've done uh, many of our audits and work remotely. And so the coordination and effort that's required to provide data and information is, is you know, can be time consuming for a lot of our clients and, we certainly appreciate that. I think the silver lining there is that many clients have, have taken that opportunity to go more paperless if they haven't already done so. So we might see some, some silver lining benefits there uh, going forward. And then uh, well, one of the things that you'd like to do with your auditors is walkthroughs of, of controls and procedures. And so how do you do that? And what we try to utilize is technology. One, uh, one tool that we use is Zoom so that we can screen share and see how people do their daily jobs to, to gain comfort that the procedures are adequate. This is one point. This is probably one of the hotter topics in the last month or so. How do we perform physical inventories? We have a lot of clients that are concerned about bringing people and guests on site. And so what we are doing is actually utilizing video technology to count inventories. We probably have probably at least a half a dozen clients that we're doing that with. But, you know, you have to, again, more planning ahead of time in terms of, you know, who it, uh, can help assist with that process. 
Um, and what are the uh, uh, environmental considerations? Like, is the lighting good enough to perform an inventory by video? So you just, just some things to think about ahead of time. And likewise, the job site observation for construction contractors, observing those construction sites, uh, many times they're outside. So we're not, we're not hearing a lot of concerns of, of, of going to observe those job sites. But if there are, you know, obviously weather considerations would have to be factored in. So moving on to uh, a couple other areas to talk to, uh, personnel interviews. Uh, this is something we've had a lot of luck again with uh, uh, technology, that uh, um, Zoom in particular, where we can again uh, have, have those face-to-face -face conversations. I will say though that it has been a little bit of a change for everybody, because I think that you know being in the same room and reading body language and understanding answers is, is a little bit easier face-to-face. -face. So it just requires a little bit more patience and you know maybe just a, a few more questions to, to really sort of get, get, get to the answer that, that you're looking for. But I've, I've, we found those technology tools to be pretty effective. So I, I think the auditors will ask uh, quite a bit about internal controls. Um, are those controls while employees are working off site, are they still effective? Many, for example, sign offs of documentation and sign offs of reconciliation and other key controls. How are those being performed? Are they being performed electronically? And how can we determine those controls are effective? The other areas of, of high risk that we may ask a lot about if there's a lot of cash handling occurring on a, at, a, at a particular location. Obviously, retail, you know, has you know probably their own considerations. But even if there's cash coming in, or even checks coming in where mail is being opened, are the controls proper and segregation duties appropriate now that a lot of employees are, are working remotely? And the same goes with uh, check disbursement. That check disbursement process, are there proper segregation duties? Who's performing the check run? Um, and also, we, we have seen a migration more and more towards wire transfers and ACHs, because they, they don't wanna make those check runs without people being on site. So are there proper controls over ACHs and wires? And those are really at high risk if they're not set correctly. And we talk a lot about use of technology, of course, with Zoom and screen sharing. But one of the things that we're asking our clients to be cognizant of is sharing of personal identifiable information. And that uh, sending stuff over email sometimes is a little riskier. So using appropriate file share uh, capabilities are probably, probably makes sense. Okay, let's pause right here and do our fourth and final poll of the day. Okay, so that poll did not work. So if you could please send me uh, just a comment uh, in the question function, that will get you uh, your poll requirement for that fourth poll uh, as necessary. But what we were essentially asking was, uh, how are you currently working, whether you are business as usual, if you've been working remotely, or if uh, you're doing some sort of a mix. So if you could just respond in the question, we will be able to record that, and apologies on the poll not launching properly. Um, and it seems like we're getting lots of responses, so, and people are doing mostly hybrid, which I would 
I think that's kind of what we would expect based on our own experience and our client's experience. Yeah. Well, I agree. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I apologize for that uh, little technical difficulty. But just a couple of last minute comments. Of course, we you know reached uh, you know 50 minutes, uh, but just a few other areas to talk about preparing for others. Uh, risk and uncertainty, I think Chuck touched on a lot on you know the areas that, that we'll be looking closely at regarding going concern and impairment. And a couple of the things, you know, uh, reviewing debt compliance with debt covenants, as well as the accounting for PPP forgiveness and how that's reflected in the financial statements. And I'd say that the more uncertainty you have in regards to some of those items, you know, having interactive discussions uh, with your auditors, as well as appropriate disclosure, because as we all know, with estimates, you know, sometimes it's very difficult, and the pandemic has made it even more difficult. So enhanced disclosures to the readers can really provide that information, and also, you know, protect yourself in terms of if you're the primary provider of those financial statements, prepare those financial statements. That, that you're providing adequate disclosure to to let the reader know how you've arrived at those estimates or assumptions. And then last, I think, you know, I guess just last comment, I guess what I'm referring to as the, quote, COVID dilemma is what happens after COVID and are we going to return to normal? Are auditors going to be on site again? I know that one of the benefits that we've seen is um, some reduced costs for being on site and travel costs in particular. So. Dilemma being is as we return to normal, are we, we going to return back on site? And we as auditors many times feel that being on site is more effective in some cases. Again, to develop relationships, ask the right questions, and observe things. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see you know, after after COVID what 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 occurs in future audits. Well, I think that's all we had for sort of commentary. And we'll Dan, I'll turn back over to you. Yeah, I think that's it. And thank you very much. Mark and Chuck for the presentation today and, and your thoughts on all the changes to try to get through in an hour. Uh, once again, we've had a lot of questions about tax, specifically around PPP and around COVID. So for that, I will direct your attention to our upcoming tax webinar that we have on Thursday. It's at 10 a.m. Thursday morning. If you did download the slide deck uh, in the handout section, the upper right-hand corner of your screen, in that PDF, you click on the register button, it will actually take you right to the registration for um, our year-end tax update. Also, you know, Chuck's a member of the COVID-19 response team here. We have done webinars related to COVID. If something does pass, uh, as Chuck kind of alluded to earlier today, we will do another COVID webinar around maybe PPP round two, whatever that stimulus might look like. We'll do another hour session on that with some Q&A. Uh, if you do have questions, we didn't, we couldn't answer them today. If you go to our website, on any page of our website, there's a contact us box at the bottom of the page. You can send directly to our team. You can also email our presenters, Mark and Chuck, using these links. Um, their information is also on the website. We thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, hopefully it was informative. Please take the survey so that you can get um, your CPE credit. You need to just mark on the survey that you do want to receive a CPE certificate. Thank you again to everyone for joining, and we hope you have a great day.